your life. A very good evening, everyone. Welcome to I Focus Online, Lecture 241, Squint and Pediatric Ophthalmology, Lecture 28. Today, we have with us Dr. Sumita Agarkar from Shankar Netralaya, Chennai, uh, talking to us on special and rare form of uh, strabismus. I uh, invite uh, Pradeep Shama, sir, to please welcome her and to introduce her to our audience. It's muted. Thank you, Shifali. It's a pleasure to welcome and introduce Dr. Sumita, uh, a name which will always bring a lot of joy and uh, pleasantness. So it's really a pleasure. She did her MS from JNM Medical College, Raipur, fellowship from Pediatric Ophthalmology, Strabismus, Neuro-Ophthalmology, Arvind Eye Hospital. And then she has held several positions as Deputy Director, Department of Pediatric, Shankar Netrale. Joint Secretary of Strabismus and uh, Pediatric Ophthalmology Society of India, SPOSI or SSI. Lead Ophthalmologist, Orbis Reach Project from uh, 2016. Member Administrative Committee, Medical Research Foundation, Shankar Netrale, and member of the Myopia Consensus Group. She has numerous publications in national and international journals to her credit. And I think we have a very vast topic for her to cover, and that's the special and rare forms of strabismus. Now over to Dr. Sumita. Ma'am, you're on mute, ma'am. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sharma, for that generous in, uh, introduction. Uh, for all the listeners, I'm going to cover special forms of strabismus, which are frustrating to treat. And that's why we are all very happy that they are rare and you don't see them that often. Uh, from those who are taking the exams, they are sometimes asked as, uh, no, maybe not as cases, but uh, you may get short notes or exam or, or questions on them, maybe mostly theory questions. But uh, to all the viewers who are joined in live, wish you all a happy Navratri. And uh, in... Uh, in Tamil Nadu, Navratri is always celebrated with a uh, with a display of dolls called Golu. And this is my Golu over the years. And the middle one is, of course, as you can see, is, uh, is the COVID Golu. And uh, all the gods are also <laughs> socially distanced in this. But uh, let's, let's look at today's uh, what I wish to cover in this uh, talk. So these are the things which, uh, which has been asked uh, for me to cover. And we start with first extraocular muscle fibrosis. Now, uh, it is a one of the cranial disinnervation syndromes. It's a rare disorder. One in 250,000 people is what is reported in the literature. It is characterized by a congenital, non-progressive, but severely restrictive strabismus. Tosis is a common association. And often head, compensatory head postures are seen, most often chin elevation. Vertical movement limitations are often more common than the horizontal. And very often, eyes are kind of fixed in down gaze. Uh, one very common thing which is seen is a perverted convergence on attempted elevation when, because of the tight muscles. When patient attempts to look up, instead of eye moving up, they tend to converge together. And that is very, very classic hallmark of congenital fibrosis of extraocular muscles. Uh, so previously, it was thought that it was a primarily a muscle disorder and where muscle tissue is replaced by uh, fibrous tissue. But uh, the newer research has showed that it is basically an absence or abnormality of oculomotor nerve, which leads to secondary atrophy and fibrosis of the muscle. Animal studies like a mice model have proved that mutations which are associated with CEF uh, EOM leads to errors of growth and direction of the oculomotor neurons. So basically it's a abnormal or poorly developed or absent oculomotor nerve or, or more specifically a superior division of oculomotor nerve which leads to secondarily a muscle uh, sequelae in terms of fibrosis and very tight muscles. Uh, clinically now they have been divided into three dominant types. There is a CEF-EOM4 and CEF-EOM5. 
along with another uh, variation in this, which is known as Tuchel syndrome, which has been recently described. But for uh, most clinical purposes, we still divide them into these broadly these three groups. Uh, CFEM is the most common. It's uh, inherited as dominant uh, pattern. Uh, penetration is very high and relatively it is a symmetrical bilateral dosis with eyes most commonly fixed in a depressed and exotropic position or isotropic position and often not associated it's isolated thing and not associated with any systemic abnormalities. CFUM is rare but it is recessively inherited. It is the rarest form of uh, CFUM and both vertical and horizontal motility can be limited. And basically, this syndrome is associated with a poorly developed third and fourth nerve nucleus. And features of both these uh, are, are seen. That's why it is also associated with retinal dystrophies and pupillary abnormalities. CFM3 is uh, dominant. It's variable and variable penetrance and expressivity is also variable. Dosis is far more common. Ocular motility restrictions can be both unilateral or bilateral can be very asymmetric and associated neurological developmental abnormalities and mental delay, mental developmental delays very often seen in this uh, syndrome. So this is an example of uh, a typical example of a CFUM1. You can see there is compensatory chin elevation. Both the eyes are fixed in downward position and has a slight amount of exotropia with this in this position. This is this is another child who has, as you can see, probably a CFUM3 because she and her brother both have similar clinical features and uh, both of them have exotropia as well as uh, limitation of almost every ocular movement in the right eye except, uh, except elevation and uh, a variable ocular motility limitation in the left eye. And the uh, parents are normal, both the siblings are affected, so probably autosomal recessive. And I feel that might be uh, a type three. So previously it was all clinical, but now there is a genetic association with, and more and more people are with genetic testing is available freely and at a reasonable uh, price. A lot of these uh, syndromes, which we used to lump as a single clinical entity are now differentiated based on their genetic patterns. And some, some cases you may genetic uh, information can actually uh, pay importance to the way you treat them. So CFEOM is, a, is associated with mutations in KIF2 21A gene. It is a kinesine motor protein which is involved in transportation along the growing axon and that leads to an abnormal ocular motor nerve development in especially the superior division. Uh, CFEM2 is associated with mutations in FOX2A and FOX2A protein is essential for differentiation of neurons in third and fourth nucleus and mutation leads to failure of both the third and fourth nucleus properly. Um, Sorry, uh, mutations in uh, TUB3 is associated with CFM3. It is uh, affected far more asymmetrically and can have a lot of systemic association. Uh, families can have abnormalities and has some variable um, phenotype. Now, other systemic associations which have been commonly uh, seen with the uh, types of CFM can be oculocutaneous albinism, facial palsy or asymmetry, Prader-Willi syndrome, ventricular septal defects, jaw winking, choroidal coloboma, and both refractive errors and amblyopia have been reported. Differential diagnosis will probably be oculomotor palsy, CPO, congenital doses. Uh, but see, oculomotor palsy usually does not lead to this kind of restriction, doses, and they may not have all the muscles involved, like in oculomotor palsy. CPO again, and CPO is again acquired and does not, most of the CFEM patients have it from birth and uh, it is not slowly progressive the way CPO is. And CPO can be a little bit, genetically can be differentiated from easily from, uh, from CFEOM. Uh, sometimes congenital ptosis can mimic uh, fibrosis of the muscle, but mu muscle movements are usually normal except for elevation in congenital ptosis. Uh, congenital myasthenic syndromes can sometimes mimic, uh, 
but they have a dynal variation and uh, sometimes other tests which are are possible. Other cranial disintegration syndromes such as horizontal gaze palsy and duance can also sometimes mimic CFUM. So management uh, in this is there is first thing you have to tell the patients is there is no clear path to restore motility or to completely make them uh, normal. Surgical approach has to be customized to address the strabismus in primary position and basically to correct the head posture. Uh, also, patients need to be counseled about suboptimal outcomes and necessity for multiple surgeries. So most common uh, uh, intervention probably these patients need, especially those because we do see the type 1, which is most common, who have very large uh, hypotropias along with ptosis. So you need a large bilateral rectus recessions with sometimes superior oblique weakening to bring the eyes to, to somewhat to midline and to, uh, to eliminate their chin up position. Uh, sometimes you may actually have to uh, recess, not only just recess the inferior rectus, but do a per periostal fixation to, uh, to get the eye to somewhere to the midline. Uh, recessions are usually not, but sometimes now the role of plication, especially with the newer publications coming up, especially in horizontal surgery is also being explored. It is also important to optimize the ptosis correction because these patients are likely to uh, be at risk for exposure, corneal exposure later on. So lifting the eye completely, lifting the lid completely probably is not a good idea. Uh, again, type three, which is associated with endocrinal as well as neuronal or developmental delay, you need a team approach with endocrinologists, neurologists, pediatricians, uh, which are required for the syndromic forms of CFEM3. So this is just to example, this case is a 14, uh, 16 year old girl who comes with this head posture with the head tilt. And on primary position, you can see she has a limitation of almost all ocular movements. And she has a large exotropia with hypotropia in the primary case. And somewhat uh, both depression, elevation, everything looks a little uh, uh, restricted, but very dramatic restriction in the vertical uh, movements, not so much to the horizontal. So this patient underwent uh, we did a CT scan, which showed out a very thinned out inferior rectus, but other muscles were normal. And because she had a large lateral rectus, uh, a large exotropia in the primary gaze, uh, which we thought her head posture was driven by uh, this uh, exotropia. So she went uh, underwent a large lateral rectus recession of 10 millimeter with inferior rectus recession of 6 millimeter with nasal shift to, to counter the A, a pattern, which... Uh, bilateral inferior rectus recession may, uh, may induce. Uh, we did a histopathology of the muscle. We showed definitely uh, muscle tissue replaced by fibrous tissue. However, I don't have her post-operative pictures, but post-operatively, she still had a residual exotropia of around 25 uh, adapter basin uh, with not much improvement in motility, but her parents were happy with the head posture. So she was not advised any other further surgery. This is again, uh, siblings, pair of siblings, as I said, the picture I showed earlier, both of them have large exotropia and um, restricted motility in almost all directions. And because they are not able to depress, I'm a little scared to do squint surgery because they, uh, they really run a risk of, uh, risk of exposure. If I just bring the eye down and ptosis is not able, we are not able to completely take care of ptosis. And both of them are densely amblyopic in one eye, as you can see, despite on uh, being in my care since they were both uh, toddlers and uh, being aggressively patched and lubricants and all, but still parents are not willing for surgery. And I'm also a little bit queasy about surgery because lids, uh, at least right now, cornea is covered and under the lids. And once uh, we bring the eye down, there is a possibility that uh, she will, they may have exposure. Uh, which is probably worse than amblyopia. So as I coming back to this patient, as I said, ki he had large isotropia, large uh, hypo, both eyes were fixed in hypotropic position with absolutely no motility. He also underwent a bilateral inferior rectus recession of around eight millimeters. But as you can see, this is a post-operative picture. There is hardly any improvement in his motility or alignment in the primary gaze. Yes. His uh, exotropia is slightly better, but uh, and head posture is slightly better. But uh, so we have offered him 
uh, further uh, surgery, but he is unwilling for that. Uh, now, coming to the strabismus in myopia, uh, myopia can have both esotropia as well as exotropia. Uh, esotropia can be a Bielkowski type of esotropia, which is low to moderate myop, which is seen in mostly low to moderate myopes. It's more for distance. And uh, a second or more dramatic type is what we call as a heavy eye syndrome or esotropia hypotropia complex, which is associated with high myopia and restricted motility. Isotropia in children uh, can also be ROP related, which is increasingly seen with uh, more and more children. Almost 17 to 25 percent of children with ROP will develop isotropia of some kind. And third, of course, is sensory, which is because of any visual uh, deprivation seen in very large anisometropic amblyops, a uh, large anisomyopic uh, individuals, where um, very high myopia in one eye actually is like a deprivation and they sometimes don't respond well to uh, patching or glasses and sometimes you can end up with a sensory isotropia in these patients. Exotropia again you can have a regular exo intermittent exotropia which is commonly seen with the uh, myopia and sometimes same sensory uh, mechanisms can work uh, with uh, very large anisomyopic uh, anisometropes also. Um, a third type, which is very, very rarely seen, is also known as exotropia hypotropia complex, uh, which also has exotropia as well as hypotropia associated with high myopia. So coming to uh, the actual topic, which is strabismus in high myopia, uh, this was first described in Bagshaw in 1966 as a heavy eye syndrome. It was thought that eye is big and that's why it kind of is hypotropic. Um, and there was a disproportion between the orbital volume and elongated myopic flow, which led to contact between groove and orbital wall, leading to a restriction in motility. Another theory which was proposed was that lateral ectus is compressed against the lateral orbital wall because the globe is so large, and that leads to a mild lateral ectus paresis and hence esotropia. But then this man came and changed our thinking. This is Dr. Yokoyama. He and Dr. Krizok from Germany, their studies on the muscle pathways in myopia and uh, in myopic large, high myopic eyes actually changed the thinking about why these patients have uh, this kind of esotropia. So basically it is a prolong uh, progressive scleral ectasia and elongation of the eyeball, which leads to a supratemporal herniation of the globe from the muscle cone. And th this leads to a downshift of the lateral of the lateral rectus and medial shift of the superior rectus, leading to both hypotropia and esotropia and a motility restriction, and that can progressively worsen over a period of time. So if you look at a normal patient here, if you see the angulation with, with the degree, with the center of the eye, eyeball, if you look at uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a MRI picture or a CT scan picture, the angle between the lateral rectus and superior rectus is somewhere between 102 point some roughly around 103 degrees. But because of a elongation of the globe and um, in, of the supratemporal herniation of the eye, the you can see that nasalization of the superior rectus means superior rectus shifts medially and inferior rectus shifts inferior in, lateral rectus shifts much more lower than what it is normal path and leading to a degree uh, angle between the two of almost more than 180 degrees occasionally. And it can be sometimes even more than that. Leading to both uh, restriction of the motility and very, very uh, large esotropia. So clinical features, it's a progressive esotropia. Again, these are associated with really high myopia, often more than 15 diopters. Uh, against all the other forms of uh, my isotropia associated with myopia. This is associated with limited abduction as well as elevation. Medial rectus is often very tight. So first action test can be positive. An MRI or CT scan can show the uh, deviation in the pathway of both superior rectus and inferior shift of medial rectus. So this is a patient who is 18 year old. And as you can see, her vision is six by 24 and in the light and PLPR in the left because of severe isotropia. And her refraction in the right eye was minus 45 diopters with 
axial length of 37 millimeter we could not check her axial length or 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 even refraction because of her cornea which was completely covered under the lid because of a severe esotropia so her ct scan as you can see here very clearly you can see the superior rectus is here and inferior rectus somewhere here it's not a very good picture but there is a gross uh, misalignment of the muscle path uh, in this uh, case so how do we manage these cases basically these uh, supra maximal uh, recession of medial rectus along with lateral rectus resection and hang back suture to avoid scler scleral suture this has been tried before and it has not been found very effective in this particular condition uh, supra transposition to a lateral rectus resection and like you uh, both do a recess resect and shift the muscles up is also a possible way and probably in milder cases you may get away with this uh, but what has really worked in in the recent uh, literature is a loop myopexy or a union of lateral rectus and superior rectus with a non absorbable suture or a silicon band which uh, kind of corrects the uh, corrects the pathway of the muscle leading to uh, you can bring the eyeball back into the muscle cone by using a loop which acts like a sling and uh, basically this is how it works that you you do, do the union of the belly union between the superior and lateral rectus and actually pull the muscle uh, pull the eyeball back into the muscle cone leading to a correction in the deviated pathways and that gives very gratifying results uh, in most patients uh, there are several variations of this basic loop myopexy principle yokoyama's technique includes uh, non desertion uh, where it does not involve disinsertion of lateral rectus and superior rectus and you pass a non absorbable adacron suture 15 mm behind the insertion of the muscle and uh, the advantage is that a scleral suture uh, in a high myopic eye is avoided and you need not take a suture but only problem with this sometimes isotropia can persist in yamada procedure there is a hemi transposition of uh, half tendon width of uh, uh, superior and lateral rectus are disinserted and then reinserted with a small 4 mm resection and often combined with a medial rectus resection uh, it corrects the path of deviated which has been demonstrated on mri also but it also involves a scleral pass through a very thin sclera in the equatorial region because it is 7 mm from the lepus so not really equatorial but uh, in in the area where the sclera might be very thick partial jensen's technique again which does not mean uh, which does not involve uh, disinsertion of the muscle and both lateral and half of superior rectus and along lateral half of lateral superior rectus and superior half of lateral rectus muscles are sutured together there is no risk of scleral perforation and even the anterior ischemic syndrome risk is minimized so these are the various uh, techniques which are available using the same principle of uh, joining uh, superior rectus and lateral rectus to correct the thing so coming back to our patient here she underwent uh, loop myopexy and this is what we used a uh, silicon 240 band to suture so here we, this is the lateral rectus and you pass a superior rectus through a scleral slip here and then both the muscles as you can see here you be used a band tie to uh, band and you can see on the table itself the isotropia is getting better in this patient and you basically you, it's a loop which is taken below superior rectus and lateral rectus and tied together and then conjunctiva is covered over it and this is her immediate post operative picture as you can see she can finally see and her vision did improve in the left eye to 2 by 60 and the patient was really happy even though she still has a bit of esotropia left and probably she will need another surgery to correct it fully but if you look there is a large dramatic improvement from here to here and it is really gratifying to do this surgery this is another gentleman again ten cataracts and very high myopia and we could not have planned for cataract surgery because of uh, his very severe esotropia which he had again he underwent a loop myopexy in left eye and as you can see 
we did a cataract surgery also along with it. His vision improved and he is really very happy with this surgery. Now, exotropia, hypotropia complex, something similar. Again, it's rarer than uh, isotropia, hypotropia complex. It has was first described by Trizog in his studies. It is also associated with high myopia and muscle path may be normal in this case, or sometimes a downward displacement of medial rectus has been uh, seen on MRI pictures. But this particular entity may actually have muscle paths which are normal. Uh, patients do well with conventional recess resect in this condition with the upshift of muscle. And sometimes if the hypotropia is large, you may have to appropriately add another vertical muscle to get it completely corrected. Uh, the largest series has been, uh, has been uh, reported by Dr. Sumit Moga, uh, with LB Prasad Institute group and uh, they have uh, really reported good results with just R and R with upshift of the muscles with occasional patient requiring a vertical muscle to correct the pattern or to correct the uh, vertical squint. Uh, now strabismus fixes there is a little bit of overlap between uh, this and the entity which I had discussed earlier. So in strabismus fixes both one or both eyes are fixed in either adducted or abducted position. Uh, isotropic is far more common than exotropic, but both forms are fairly rare. It can be congenital or acquired and compensatory head postures are again fairly common. So these are the causes probably of acquired, which is contracture of medial rectus following a very, very large, no long standing lateral rectus palsy, sometimes secondary to amyloidosis and secondary to hypomyopia as I discussed earlier. So FDT is almost always positive. And the problem with this sometimes can be a mechanical stretching. And if you leave it uncorrected or if you don't do anything, then sometimes a mechani mechanical stretching and torsion of the optic nerve with the strangula strangulation in its blood supply can lead to optic atrophy as well as CRAO. So sometimes you need to do surgery because of the extreme um, fixation of the globe, which uh, changes the, which kind of pulls on optic nerve. So again, management is difficult, frustrating, but your goals are very, uh, very, very modest to provide some kind of cosmetic and functional improvement. Uh, abduction beyond midline may not improve after surgery, and this must be discussed with, uh, with the, with the, with the par patients or parents. And you do hope to increase the field of vision to some extent. So this is one patient. Uh, she has, as you can see, She's a 21 year old, has a atrial septal defect and other cardiac abnormalities, squinting since birth. Visual acuity is six by six because she has a variable face turn on both sides and she uses one eye at a time, turns the head to both sides, and that's why she has extremely good vision and a very large exotropia with absolutely no adduction. Elevation and depression appears normal. FDT was positive. When she came to me, she had already undergone a large lateral rectus recession and resection in one eye. And uh, I had seen her previous to the first surgery also, and she looked sane. And this is after r, &R in the uh, in the left eye. And uh, as you can see, there is hardly any improvement in the exotropia or her motility. So I went ahead and did... Uh, right eye super, supra maximal lateral rectus recession again almost like a periosteal fixation and i added a modified nishida's procedure to give some kind of transposition relief i'm sorry to say she looks same postoperatively after six months residual exotropia of almost similar thing face turn has improved a bit but that kind that might be my imagination also both adduction and abduction remain the same and my further plan is to either do a lateral rectus transposition to the medial rectus to give some kind of uh, adduction force and maybe ask, send the patient to Dr. Pradeep Sharma to do the needful. So coming to the next, cyclic heterotropia. Uh, again, this is a very intriguing form of strabismus and depends on a regular cyclic pattern. Usually it is a 48 hour rhythm, but we have seen a cycle of 24 hours or 48 hours or sometimes even 72 and 96 hour cycle has been uh, described and it it follows a very typical 24 hour uh, pattern of normal binocular vision with straight eyes and a 24 hour cycle of manifest 
<clears throat> heterotropia. Isotropia is most commonly seen. I have never seen exotropia with, in a cyclic matter. Uh, but uh, literature does report some vertical deviation as well as exotropia uh, following a cyclic pattern. So usually cycle is for 24 to 48 hours. But as I said earlier, you have longer cycles also. Presentation is in early childhood, much more commonly than in adulthood. On strabismic days, patient has usually a large angle isotropia. Diplopia may or may not be present. Uh, defective fusional amplitudes are seen on that day, but sensory fusion is present. And cyclic, if you follow, if you look at the natural history of these patients, cyclic nature usually may last for a few months to any year, some years, but ultimately it leads to constant tropia. Uh, mechanism is ill-defined, probably a disturbance in circadian rhythm. Uh, sometimes other triggers have also been known to uh, known to uh, trigger cyclic isotropia. And these are stress, changes in time zone, sometimes retinal detachment, optic atrophy, traumatic aphakia. All these conditions have been reported in literature to be associated with, uh, uh, with cyclic isotropia. And the other reported associations are these. So how do we manage these patients? Um, first is, of course, to give uh, full correction and manage ambiopia, if any. And a lot of them do well if, if you do surgery based on full amount of heterotropia during strabismic days. So the sometimes the difference between straight days and strabismic days can be around 35 to 40 prism. But None of the, if you review the literature, none of the authors have reported diplopia. Uh, and uh, for on the days, uh, if, if the surgery was done on based on maximum angle, which has been noticed. Uh, not only uh, outcomes have been uh, uh, good, but they have also been stable. Long term results do show that these children do well with alignment based on surgical alignment based on their maximum angles recorded. Uh, there are few reports in the literature about injection Botox, especially if you see them in the early part of their uh, cyclic uh, isotropia onset, you can give Botox. And there are at least two reports where Botox has been sufficient by itself to, uh, to reverse to orthotropia or, <clears throat> or to get rid of the cyclic nature of the isotropia. So this is a six-year-old male who has come to us uh, recently. In fact, day before yesterday. And uh, his best corrected visual activity was 612 in both eyes. He was wearing hypropic glasses since three years. Was noted ortho with glasses. But then he, he saw another doctor who, because of his uh, slightly um, subnormal vision, was at, who advised him alternate patching. Following alternate patching, he developed intermittent esotropia with diplopia. So they went to another doctor who stopped patch and according to the parents, he regained alignment. But now they notice him with this 24 hour cycle of straight and isotropic eyes. Both anterior and posterior segment were normal, MRI was normal and discs were healthy. So this is the patient's picture yesterday according to his father who has taken and this is what I saw in the clinic today. Again, this is his refractive uh, cycloplegic refraction and he's wearing almost his full correction here. So in his case, because it was precipitated by, by uh, some kind of patching, we think it is probably a swan type of acquired isotropia, but it, it is clearly showing a cyclic rhythm the way it has been described in the literature. So these are two pictures and again, we did ask for Another two pictures, we have observed him for another 48 hours now. And that's the picture of yesterday. And this is today again in my clinic. So our plan for this child is because he is still in the early phases. And this has been noted only for past three months. I am planning to give injection Botox to him. and See from where it goes. But literature does show encouraging results with Botox or even sometimes prisms with this entity. Coming to acquired motor fusion deficiency or horror fusion is, again, this is first described as early as 1935. And it is defined as an acquired motor fusion deficiency. 
it is an infrequent disturbance of uh, fusional convergence and divergence with a decreased range of accommodation. Uh, what are the causes? Closed head trauma, cerebrovascular accidents, intracranial tumors, damage to midbrain and post-viral syndromes all have been associated with, uh, with fusion deficiency or acquired fusional disruption or central fusion disruption, which is the other term which is used for this condition. Important to note that prolonged visual deprivation like a long-standing cataract or a unilateral aphakia can also lead to fusion disruption and strabismus associated with fusion disruption, mostly exotropia. So it is very important that a lot of these children who develop, who develop, uh, who have trauma at age, say, 10 or 8 after visual maturity has been achieved, they often have exotropia. And these children often don't fuse well and continue to have intractable diplopia. So you should be careful when you're planning to do a secondary IOL in these, these children. So clinical features are usually intractable diplopia and inability to fuse, maintain fusion. Rather, a lot of patients, when you put the appropriate prisms in front of their eyes, they claim that images are superimposed over each other, but they are not able to fuse them into a single image the way a normal people see. Post-traumatic fusion deficiency may also follow actually surgical correction of a paralytic strabismus, especially associated with trauma. Dipropia persists even after appropriate uh, strabismus surgery, even after achieving good alignment. Um, decreased or absence of fusional amplitudes can be seen if you check their fusional amplitudes. However, sensory fusion and stereopsis is intact. Management, there is no effective therapy. Prisms, sometimes there is, uh, can work, but it constantly needs readjustment of the power and direction of the prism base. Injection Botox has been tried in these patients also with variable results. Occluding scleral contact lenses, glasses or Baumgartner's foils are just to occlude one eye to get rid of intractable diplopia is last resort in these patients. Infrequently, you do see spontaneous improvement and that is the most win-win situation. There is a few reports of surgery with uh, to correct the angles and to achieve ocular alignment. And that has uh, given, according to subjectively satisfactory outcomes, though patients continue to have diplopia, but they often feel better with superimposed images rather than very far away disparate images. So surgery can be tried but it requires the appropriate counseling and increased chair time before you do plan for surgery in these patients. Now coming last to last in, in this whole array of uh, potpourri of topics, uh, we are coming to superior oblique myokymia. Again, this was described as early as in 1906 by Duance, but actual description of the condition was by Hoyt and Keane as a unilateral rotary micro tremor in, in, in 19, uh, much later. So it's a monocular high frequency, low amplitude torsional uh, involuntary contractions of the superior oblique muscle that results in oscillopsia and uh, diplopia more often in the down gaze. Uh, clinical features, yeah, patients report usually complaining of diplopia, oscillopsia or um, disturbance in the vision. Sometimes if you put a stethoscope in the superior oblique uh, region, you can hear as if a car is raving uh, because of a very quick movement of superior oblique through the trochlea. And that is being described as Honda sign. Uh, several triggers have been associated with superior oblique myokamia, such as light, alcohol, stress, some drugs have also known to precipitate superior oblique myokamia. But mostly the diagnosis is very, 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 very typically clinical. And only thing is sometimes the tremor is, can be so small that uh, sometimes you may have to actually use a slit lamp to see that. Sometimes it is very easily seen as in this uh, video. Uh, this is a video courtesy Dr. Banumati from Dr. Narayan Netralya. And I'm so thankful for sharing this video. With me. She was able to share this beautiful video. As you can see, it's a torsional small, really small amplitude nystagmus, but it worsens in the down gaze and can give, can give rise to, 
visual symptoms in the patients. Why it happens? There are several theories. Epiphatic, epiphatic, ep epiphatic transmission has been postulated. But most common or most accepted uh, hypothesis is probably it's a neurovascular compression, which leads to segmental demyelination of the nerve in the zone which is covered by oligodendrocytes leading to uh, uh, muscle uh, neural irritation, uh, which leads to due to the axonal transmission. Other people think that it is arises from dysfunctional supranuclear output, input to trochlear nucleus with secondary regeneration. But most probably, most often, it is very, very subtle, which is difficult to pick up on your MRI, a neurovascular compression of the trochlear nerve at root exit zone of the brainstem, which causes a little bit of uh, uh, demyelination as uh, in the, that area which is covered by oligodendrocytes, where, which are not as uh, stable as Schwann cells, which cover the rest of the nerve. Uh, and that probably it takes special screen, special MRI to pick up this, but probably that's a reason in some patients. Uh, sometimes it can be post long standing superior oblique palsy also, so it can be a part of denervational syndrome too. So it's usually benign and unlikely to have systemic association, rarely posterior fossa tumors and dural arteriovenous fistula and adrenal leukodystrophy has been. Uh, reported in the literature. Myokymia has also been reported to occur months and years after an acquired superior oblique palsy uh, as a post-denervation phenomenon. And if you do EMG in these patients, you can see a spontaneous discharge of trochlear neurons that have undergone uh, regenerative changes. Differentials are very few. Maybe ocular neuromyotonia can be confused for SOM which is a spontaneous episodic contraction of one or more extraocular muscles, which are often associated with the radiation injury. Uh, how do you differentiate from superior oblique myokinia? Tempo is much slower. As you can see in that video, it is SOM can be a little easily seen. It's almost always unilateral. SOM is almost always unilateral, while neuromyotonia can be bilateral. And neuromyotonia can be elicited by sustained eccentric gaze. So, this is the only differential for superior oblique nerve. How do you manage? Management is, uh, again, not perfect. Uh, management has, when you see several things working for something, probably that means that it's not, everything is not working for everyone. So carbamazepine is the most commonly used drug. Nowadays, beta blockers like propranolol hydrochloride as oral or topical beta blockers have also been used with variable success. People have reported good results, especially if neurovascular comp compression is noted with gabapentin and memantin. And other uh, oral preparations which have been used are pheno phenotoin, clonazepam and baclofen, again with variable results. Surgical management, if it persists and does not respond to surgical uh, medical management, you can look plan for tenotomy or tenectomy of superior oblique tendon, which can be combined with a myectomy of ipsilateral inferior oblique. And in, as I said, in rare cases, you may need a like last last resort can be a microvascular decompression of the trochlear nerve at the root exit zone, which has been reported as successful. But there has been only one case report. So this is uh, basically an algorithm to treat uh, superior oblique, uh, my, symptomatic superior oblique myokymia. You try topical beta blocker as your first line. If there is improvement, you maintain it or consider dose reduction. If there is no improvement, you can look for whether it is patient is prefer surgical or medical treatment. Medical treatment can move to the second line of drugs like baclofen, carbamazepine, memantine, or gabamentine. If there is no improvement, you look at neuroimaging with special techniques to see if there is a neurovascular compression. If nothing is seen, then you can go for superior oblique tenotomy with an inferior oblique weakening. And if there is really an evidence of neurovascular compression, uh, intracranial surgery is, is, is required. Basically, 
it is compression happens because superior cerebellar artery is in very close contact with trochlear nerve and that can cause a, a localized demyelination leading to superior oblique. So if you put a Teflon plate in between superior cerebellar artery and trochlear nerve, you can. Basically, that's what is meant by uh, neuro, uh, neuro surgery, which is uh, done in these cases. And with that, I come to the end of this and thank you for the attention. I'll be happy to take questions. If I'm Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, indeed, a vast and difficult topic, and you made it so interesting with all the cases that you showed. Uh, Pradeep, sir, Amitabha, sir. Every patients were equally happy with them. <laughs> sir, any comments from you before we go on to the questions? I think we should be uh, going through the questions. I mean, it's uh, such a vast topic, and the comments, I mean, she's covered so many topic, uh, conditions which uh, thankfully are rare and they boggle your mind whenever they come. So like CFUMs, you have to uh, take care of each case individually. Uh, that's what, I mean, genetic studies we don't usually do. I mean, it doesn't really, uh, it's more from academic point of view, I think. It doesn't really change the uh, management. So management has to be more clinically and it has to be individualized. And mostly we'll have to see the force duction intraoperatively and do either the recessions of the inferior rectus, superior obliques, and the little rectus as required. Uh, regarding the myopic strabismus fixes, I think she covered various types of that. I think there is a very nice uh, talk by Dr. Deemer, and he has uh, tried to uh, further differentiate uh, cases like in the form of sagging eye, heavy eye, and the knobby eye syndromes, uh, depending on the uh, severity of the myopia. So the I forgot to cover sagging eye syndrome. Sorry, that was <laughs> that slipped from my mind. Yeah. So, and the, uh, another one which he has talked about is a knobby eye syndrome, which is like 20 plus di uh, diopter myopes. They may have just because of a structural uh, staphylomatous presentation that it prevents the or uh, motility in the orbit. So, that is another thing which I found interesting that sometimes this happens. And even, I mean, sometimes we have come across cases with congenital staphyloma. Uh, I mean, one or two cases which have boggled me when I was trying to do surgery and it didn't have any effect. And then when I did a force duction, I realized it was having a uh, staphylomatous extension uh, congenital, which was preventing the motility. So whatever you do, any muscle surgery will not work in such a situation. So that was an interesting thing. Uh, regarding the cyclic squints, we have come across even cyclic exotropias. And I would like to say that we should differentiate congenital and acquired cyclic heterotropias. The congenital esotropias actually uh, respond very well to just medial lectus recessions. But the acquired cyclic esotropias we usually have problems to manage. And we have seen that in addition to the MR recession, we usually have to do a Fardin or posterior fixation on the medial lectus to be more effective. And the, uh, the cyclic exotropias uh, uh, again is a situation which is difficult to handle. Uh, in uh, those, we have uh, tried to do the Scott for, uh, suit, the Scott procedure, that is the combined rejection and recession of the lateral rectus in order to give this Faden-like effect, uh, which will correct. So those, I think we did report that, uh, I mean, these acquired cyclic squints can be managed a little differently. So that is one thing which is there. Again, the, uh, uh, the fusion disruption situations are really, really difficult to manage. And uh, sometimes they come across unnoticed. You may just think it's a, a squint surgery. You do an LRMR and you keep on having a problem because the patient keeps on complaining of diplopia, which you never thought it would be there. And it's very difficult. And sometimes you have to just give them patching for some time. And if you are lucky, it may uh, just correct with that. Uh, so public myokymia, I think Dr. Sumita has given a very nice flow uh, algorithm that how you can manage with the beta blockers first and then with the um, uh, management like gabapentin and uh, carbamazepine. So these are rare and we have come across some cases which may be uh, managed in that manner. So I think uh, with this, I would ask Dr. Amitava if he has anything to add before we can have the questions. Not really. I think she did a delightful job. I mean, uh, about covering these topics, which are which are rare, definitely rare and uncommon. Thank God they are rare. Yes. <laughs> Thank God they are. Rare. <laughs>
it's like that american uh, presidency candidate thing no they thank god they only two <laughs> <laughs> so we'll move on to the questions uh, the first one is how do we differentiate between ino and one and a half syndrome this is here question is this out of course yeah <laughs> <laughs> it can be covered because our audience is yeah so basically ino is uh, internuclear ophthalmoplegy sir can i ask you to answer this question <laughs> okay so basically what he uh, the question is that in uh, ino is a condition in which the middle longitudinal fasciculus has been affected either by a demyelinating disease or ischemic condition in which there is an adduction deficiency but the convergence is intact in the uh, more uh, what we say is the posterior ino and there may be some situations of um, uh, the ino in which even the convergence is affected when the medial ectus fibers of the subnucleus are also involved so that is a entity which is totally different from a uh, one and a half syndrome in which there will be a sixth nerve or a palsy or a gaze palsy along with a ino so that is a lesion in the uh, pontine area so uh, both are little different there may be a overlap of uh, one over the other uh, but i think in uh, i know there is nothing uh, no abduction deficiency only an abduction nystagmus in the contralateral eye would be there but in an one and a half uh, there would be an abduction deficiency which would be there in addition to the abduction deficiency so what uh, uh, clinically what we'll see is that both abduction and abduction are affected in one eye and in the other eye there would be a deficiency of the adduction so that will be a one and a half syndrome that's why it's called and uh, an abducting nystagmus yeah no in the one and a half may not be having an abduction nystagmus because of the paresis right yeah. okay uh, so next one is can you please explain the clinical approach in strabismus fixus uh strabismus fixus basically it depends on as i said ki these are difficult to maintain and you have to customize it as dr sharma said so your goal is just to uh, give some kind of alignment in the primary gaze it is impossible to give them straight eyes in all gazes but we do really focus on uh, what is in the primary gaze and probably in the down gaze these are our aims there and again despite doing massive surgeries multiple surgeries sometimes it's just not possible so suboptimal outcomes are 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 probably very often seen but we focus on getting the head posture slightly better and we also look at aligning the eyes in the primary gaze so if there is a say a a very large convergent convergence fixes i would do a by again depending on cause i would do a bimedial recession if it is a convergent fixes which is associated with uh, high myopia it does give gratifying results with doing the surgery but my other case where there was eyes were fixed in adducted position we have to somehow at least get eyes to align where where she doesn't have to do a 45 degree head posture Uh, head turn to see well if you can bring the head posture down to 15 degrees that also is a good outcome so strabismus fixus is a uh, difficult to achieve uh, your regular nomograms of success in a strabismus surgery like eight prisms plus minus or head no head posture don't apply for strabismus fixus strabismus fixus is making it better for patient to fuse making it better for him to look reasonably okay in the primary gaze but we are not attempting to use the traditional success nomograms which we use for strabismus that you i will align them within within 10 diopters of orthophoria no we are not looking at that but given the limitations we do align and as a there was a study on cfum again which sometimes can look like a strabismus fixus only there is a little bit of overlap between fixes and cfum probably they are somehow related to each other or they are probably variations of severe or the same thing same pathology going on in the muscles at least so if you if you have a very large exotropia which allows which uh, has to have a 45 degrees face turn you can do a surgery 
to bring it down to say 15 degrees of face turn, which is still acceptable for the patients. Then rather than going for saying, I'm going to get for aim for orthophoria, this is not possible. And there is a large study which looked at how they did. And on an average, every patient in that, uh, the study from the Boston group by Gina Haidari et al. On an average patient needed three to four surgeries. So patient should be willing. What lot of our patients are not be willing to go for a second surgery only because they don't see immediate improvement. So yes, so customization and need for multiple surgeries and non-traditional nomograms. And with that, you look at what patient has in the primary is and what is driving the head posture and correct for that, whatever is possible within your needs. So I can't give a standard, okay, I'll do this for this, but what that patient has and depending on what he needs. Like the patient which I showed who has this both eyes fixed in down gaze. He's also a kind of fixes only, even though he has CFUM. I, as a first sitting, I have done only inferior rectus. As you can see, hardly any improvement in his head posture or on his alignment. So now what? You can disinsert those and laterally fixed. You can add a superior oblique uh, weakening procedure, or superior oblique tenotomy as a second sitting. You can also, as I said previously, the norm was no, no resection of plications, but now people are describing to do a superior rectus plication probably that might be required. But again, I can't do everything in one city. I have to sometimes stage it, These, depending on what you get out of first surgery. So I think we have to look at what we can achieve and what we can give. And there cannot be a single answer to this. Key. Do this. You have to see the patient and then But that's the same. Look at primary gaze. Look at what is driving the head posture. And can you make it better than what it is? That's all. And you also tell the patient very clearly about limitations of surgery in these cases. Tell them about need for multiple surgery. Amrita, was there any inputs from you? No, no. I think uh, uh, she's covered all the uh, aspects very well. She, these are, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm always very dicey because expectations are so huge, even from these people with fixes. And they've come after so many years that everything is very caught up. Uh, one of the issues I've been thinking of is, you know, these other soft tissues are also been positioned in that manner for all these many years, that even if you touch these muscles and let go, all the cushions at the back are still holding the eye in that, in that, uh, in that position. It doesn't easily change its direction. Uh, and I'm not sure if maybe some of us should try giving tractional sutures for maybe a couple of days to, you know, lift that eye uh, in a different, into a little more a central position. Over, actually, over a period of time. actually, that when I did the inferior rectus recession, I did uh, probably seven millimeter, I fixed it, hung back for another one millimeter or so. I used a superior bolster. Uh, hmm. uh, I mean, I fixed yeah. the eye up. Correct, absolutely. It's, it's yes. a monster. And yeah, still, yeah. at six weeks, he is looking as if I did not do anything. Ah, at exactly. So, See, because we are trying to change that. You know, it's like if you've been sitting yeah. on a cushion for a long time and you get up, you'll notice the entire cushion has taken a certain shape and, you know, has kept you there in that position. And it can be a tough call there. Tough call. Yeah. So, I think counseling is required and yeah. customization is required and you have to clearly admit your limitations as a, as a surgeon. This is all I'm looking for and this is all I'm getting. If you and patient are on the same page, then only do the surgery. Otherwise, Correct. Okay. Next one is what problems can we anticipate intraoperatively in loop myopexy? Intraoperatively, sometimes muscle can be very tight, sclera is thin. So, uh, you can perforate the sclera if you are going to use a technique which requires you to anchor the loop to the sclera. Uh, so that is a little bit of a problem in very, very large. These, as I said, most of this uh, loop myopexy patients who require loop myopexy are going to be 15 diopters or more, excellence are 31 or more. And, uh, and tight muscle is also a problem sometimes. Sometimes anterior segment ischemia can happen. Sometimes you can induce a torsional, uh, uh, torsional element, which is iatrogenic because of your anchoring and because you are suturing the muscle to sclera. Uh, 
So intraoperatively, tight muscle is a problem. Uh, especially if it is slightly old or older patients, you have to be very careful about uh, what we call as split in two muscles or uh, pulled into uh, the pit syndrome. It can happen with medial rectus when you are uh, when you are manipulating the globe. You can perforate the sclera while passing the suture through sclera. With Yokoyama's technique, that is a big advantage that you don't have to. You have, but Sometimes you have to go really posterior for Yokoyama's technique. You have to pass suture through superior rectus and lateral rectus at 15 millimeters from the insertion. So it requires a fair amount of uh, dissection and you have to have good assistant and a good exposure to and a, a sound knowledge of anatomy of that area. But it is doable. It's not, it's not that difficult. With a little bit of experience and patience, anybody can do it. I think the rest of the questions ma'am has covered in her lecture. Uh, so concluding remarks, Pradeep sir, Amitava sir. I think these cases are uh, teaching us uh, some things uh, from the, uh, in, a, in a different fashion. For example, like myopic strabismus fixes was earlier being considered as basically a restrictive problem. And people were doing large amounts of medial rectus recessions and still failing. Till the time that Yokoyama and then later on the modifications by Yamada and uh, the Nishida's approaches are all basically telling us that it is a problem of the path of the muscles and not the fibrosis of the muscles alone. And it was because of the uh, shifting of the uh, superior rectus and the lateral rectus because of a uh, weak uh, loop between the superior rectus and the uh, lateral rectus or because of the uh, myopia itself which is causing a degeneration of that and once we started knowing that we did a procedure just by uh, reshifting the positions and the corrections were much much better so i think we are basically learning it in uh, that the things have to be managed differently the strabismus fixes uh, is different now from what we would have seen earlier 20 years back and put them together with the congenital fibrosis extraocular muscles. Now, CFUMs are different. They are tight muscles, whereas the myopic uh, strabismus fixes are not actually tight muscles except for the medial rectus, which may be uh, having a secondary contracture because of long-standing thing. Many situations of myopic strabismus fixes, we may not even have to do an MR recession and get along just with the uh, root shifting by a loop myopexy. So I usually prefer the Yamada's modification. I put the suture at eight millimeter between the superiectus and lateralectus and take a scleral bite because if you do not have this and you just do uh, loop, um, this thing uh, loop by using a silicon band, uh, it has been seen that it slips posteriorly because uh, and then it may lose the effect. And that's why the technique described by Yokoyama has shown that esotropia may still be there. So if you want to have more effective correction, you need to have a bite in the sclera and you may take it just eight millimeter from the insertion and in both superiectus and lateral rectus, and it works fairly well. So, I mean, we are having these newer techniques which are now helping us uh, correct these uh, rare problems and more will still be there. We'll be learning each day from such talks by Sumita. So thank you, Dr. Sumita. Thank, thank you, uh, Amitava, for uh, co-chairing and thank you, Shefali, for moderating so well. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you so much, ma'am, for spending the evening with us and educating our residents uh, with such an amazing lecture. And Pradeep, sir, Amitava, sir, always for the inputs that you give for the discussion. Uh, next, we'll meet on September 30th. Uh, the topic is Strabismus and Myasthenia Gravis uh, and CPEO by Dr. Ramesh Murthy. So, see you all on September 30th. I think one thing we have months. missed from your program, I, I think... There is graves of Thanupati is uh, establishment associated with graves is missing from your program. Yeah, I was also thinking that somebody would in the rest okay. of you would talk, but yeah, because I, I just saw the program today. I think somewhere yeah. that has to be added. It's getting slipped out by each one. <laughs> Even <laughs> so I think maybe it will be in a potpourri by somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of adding, but it was not in my menu. So I left it. But uh -huh. you, you could have. I mean, basically, yeah, I because yours was a little... All the restrictive strabismus. So I was just thinking, should I add four slides on that also? And then you could I, have I, will, I will finish in one and a half hours. If I... Yeah. <laughs>